Welcome to CSI Coats Film. Today's segment, we're going to be looking at hair evidence. Now, before we get started, a tragic story. As you may know, Bill Cosby's son, Ennis Cosby, January 16, 1997, gunned down in cold blood in an attempted robbery along a California highway. Tragic, tragic death. And in a time when Los Angeles had many racial tensions, here, 19-year-old Mikhail Markasev is charged with robbery and murder. Question for us, how did hair evidence factor into placing Markasev at the crime scene? Well, as we get into today's program, we're going to investigate the structure of hair we look at the structure of hair, we want to identify differences between human and animal hair, as well as how can we use hair as evidence. First, hair structure. Keep in mind that hair protrudes through the skin, uh, through the epidermis, down into the under layer, known as the dermis that you can see here. And here is the structure that grows here known as a follicle. So it's a very tiny organ under the skin. And as you can see here, the, the blood supply goes right into the root of the hair, which we refer to as the bulb of the hair. And so we have a very good blood supply. That's going to be important as we consider evidence later on. And so hair absorbs dissolved substances that are in the blood. Now, as we look at the structure of hair, we're going from the outside to the inside. First, the cuticle scales that are on the outside that cover um, and protect the inside of the hair shaft with overlapping scales. And then as we go further in, we're going to see this spongy material known as the cortex, which forms the inner layer, uh, the vast majority of the mass of the, of the hair shaft itself is made out of a protein known as keratin. And embedded in that keratin are pigment proteins known as melanin. Of course, they can vary from uh, one person to the next. There are also air sacs that we don't see pictured here that are embedded in the cortex. And then finally to the center of the hair shaft is known as the medulla, the innermost part of the hair shaft that runs down the center of the cortex. Now, as you take a look at this micrograph that I made the other day, can you identify the four different parts? On the very outside, we can see the cuticle. As we f go further in, where all this pigment is, is the cortex. And then, you probably figured this out already, didn't you? We have the medulla. Keep in mind, not every specimen that you look at is going to have a medulla, all right? And then as we move on to hair structure, keep in mind that hair grows. And it grows and it falls out. <laughs> so we can find all kinds of hair in our hairbrush. But oh, where is my hairbrush? So hair is a lifespan, typically between five and six years for humans. Of course, that's gonna vary from one person to the next. And on average, it grows about a centimeter a month. Uh, and that's gonna be important later on as we take a look at the use of hair as evidence. The first phase is the growth phase, known as the antigen phase. This is gonna last up to five years or 80 to 90% of the lifespan of that hair follicle. And then a brief catagen phase in which the hair stops growing. And then finally, the third phase, which can run from two to six months in which the hair is forced from the follicle. And of course, that hair is going to be replaced by other hair until you get to be my age. Keep in mind that these are in alphabetical order, so it makes them easy to keep them. So, all right, ACT. Human or animal, how can we tell them apart? Let's take a look at the structures that we've just been introduced to. As you look at the cuticle, we'll start at the outside. You can see that there are a variety of different patterns of cuticle structures. These are not easily seen, uh, as you saw a moment ago, with a light microscope, but you can do some tricks to visualize those, which I'll show you in a moment. 
First off, let's take a look at those that are found in rodents. Typically, these scales are going to wrap all the way around the diameter of the hair shaft that you see pictured here. And that's typical of mice, of other rodents like rats, and of course of rabbits. Now there is that are found on cats, and these kind of form either a herringbone pattern uh, that's typical of domestic cats, or you can find those scales form rings that go around and around, as you can see here, around the shaft. And, and then finally, and of course not least important, are those that are found on humans down at the bottom here, uh, and on dogs as well. We can see these very fine scales that kind of form a brick pattern that go all the way around. Now, how do we visualize these? You can't see them very easily with a light microscope by themselves. So what you want to do is you want to take a glass slide, a microscope slide, and lay down a very thin layer of clear nail polish. Allow that to set up for a second. Lay down a hair into that nail polish. Let it dry for about 30 seconds to a minute, and then remove the hair shaft. Basically what you're going to get is a cast of the cuticle and so you can identify very easily uh, the structure that's, that's here on the outside. Now, of these three, what do you think this is? Well, we've certainly eliminated rodents, haven't we? Because that's certainly not coronal, and neither is it spinous, so we've eliminated cats. So we're either it's a dog or it's a human, and then we'll have to investigate further from there. Very useful technique, though. And again, human or animal, as we look further inside, we want to examine the medulla in particular. These can form different patterns as well. I said that you may find hair that does not have a medulla, or it may be very fragmentary in its appearance. So you may have to look down the length of the shaft, or it may be interrupted by gaps that you see here. It's also very likely that you're going to find patterns that are continuous, where there's nearly no break in the medulla as well. They can be very thin or they can be very thick. And then, like in a dog hair that I examined just the other day, we can see those that are actually stacked. They look like little uh, pills that are stacked right next to each other that go the whole diameter of the hair shaft. Now, take a look at the slide that you saw a moment ago. What pattern would this form? Okay, You can probably eliminate continuous, can't you? And as we examine hair shafts, uh, you're going to see that it's not uncommon to find fragmentary or interrupted hair patterns. Or again, not at all. Human or animal. Also, we want to look at something known as the muddlery index. In other words, we want to measure the relative thickness of the medulla. You can see this one appears to be quite thin. So if we were to take this diameter of the medulla, and we are at its thickest point, and we were to divide that by the hair's diameter itself, this distance here, you can see that the ratio of this is going to be quite low because this medulla is quite thin. As a general rule, human medulla medullary index is going to be less than a third. Okay? Keep that in mind. So 0.3 or lower. Animals are typically more than half. For example, if you take a look at this one here, this hair, uh, which is a dog's hair, by the way, we have a, definitely we have a medulla. That happens to be stacked, by the way. But we have a very thick medulla that's almost all the way across the diameter of the shaft. So this is definitely not human. Now, in our final content segment here, hair is evidence. What can we learn from the hair that we find at crime scenes? First, keep in mind, hair is class evidence. So hairs that we find are going to fall into certain categories of characteristics based upon color, based upon the muddlery index that we've looked at. Also something that we didn't discuss known as configuration. In other words, is the hair basically shaped um, in, a, in a straight pattern or is it twisted? As we slice through that hair shaft, is it going to be round? Is it going to be oval? Or is it going to be kind of crescent shaped? Depending upon the origin of where the hair follicle was, what part of the body 
Uh, that's going to vary quite a bit. So we can categorize these uh, into certain classes. We can also uncover what we call mitochondrial DNA. Keep in mind, mitochondria are those tiny organelles found in cells that produce energy for the cells, ATP specifically. And these come from the original egg when the sperm and egg first unite in fertilization. All these mitochondria are inherited and produced by the original mitochondria that came from the mother's egg. We have before us a way of determining the maternal lineage of wherever that hair came from. Then again, only on the mother's side. So it's still class evidence. You can have siblings, for example. And the mitochondrial DNA from one generation to the next doesn't change that much. But it's certainly going to narrow down the source of the hair if we can extract that mitochondrial DNA. But wait, there's more. Keep in mind, we said at the outset that there's a very good blood supply that penetrates right into the bulb at the base of the hair shaft within the follicle. Whether it falls out and you find it on a hairbrush or a piece of fabric or whether it's been forcibly removed, here we have some tissue left from the follicle that's still adhering to the bulb of the hair shaft. So what do we have there? We have individual evidence because we have that person's nuclear DNA found in the nucleus of the cells that are in the blood and the other tissue that surrounds the bulb that we have here. So then we can individuate quite well with the DNA that we get from there. And of course, we're gonna do a unit on DNA later on this year. Now, not only can we learn about the origin of that hair, but we can also learn about what that person's been exposed to. As we said at the top of the segment, we have a very rich blood supply that whatever we find in the blood, we're also going to see substances that are excreted from the blood into the keratin, into the protein uh, that's in the hair shaft itself right here as well as the oils that are excreted by that organ. And so what do we learn? Well, we're going to learn exposure of different chemicals and whether that person's had a history of drug use. Keep in mind that we have a, a rate of growth of basically one centimeter per month, as we mentioned previously. And so we're basically provided in a hair shaft with a history of a person's exposure to not only hair treatments and of course hair dyes, but also what's been in the blood that's going to come out uh, into that hair shaft. And that's why, as you would expect, hair can be used in order to do drug testing. Now in our Consider the Following segment tonight, I have four questions for you. If you're using my note guide, you can flip it over and write these four questions down, leaving space for responses. First, how is a hair structure like a pencil? I'd like you to think about that for a minute. Maybe make a sketch of that and make a comparison of those two. Secondly, list as many characteristics as you can that you learn in this program whereby we can distinguish human and animal hair. Third, if a urine test is a snapshot of a person's drug use or even a blood test, what analogy is fitting for a hair shaft? And explain the analogy that you come up with. And then finally, what additional hair evidence can a violent crime leave behind? Again, focus on hair evidence. What additional information is the crime scene be provided with? And then elaborate on your response on that. Now, as we go back to the case that we started with, a death in the family, the suspect, Markusev, confided in a friend who informed police of the weapon's location. And when that weapon was recovered, it was found wrapped in a cap. And guess what was in the cap? You guessed it. DNA extracted from a hair follicle linked Markusev to the weapon. And that, among other evidence, led to the conviction of Mikhail Markusev, 1997. Tragic, tragic death. Here, 29-year-old 
Ennis Cosby, had decided to become a teacher. In fact, he was working on his master's degree to become a special education teacher when he was gunned down along that California highway, tragically. And yet, due to the fact that uh, Markusev had been brought up in a family situation where there was a lot of bigotry, his very remorseful repentance uh, during the sentencing phase of the trial, the Cosby family declined in seeking the death penalty in this case. Tragic death. And of course, they have to live with the reality of waking up every day knowing they don't have their son Ennis with them anymore. And like you, my heart goes out to the Cosby family. Well, you can see that hair evidence played an important role in this case, as it does in many others. Many crime scenes have hair evidence. Well, that's all we have for now. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.